Matthew chapter 5. My message this morning, really, we could preach a lot of different messages, go a lot of different ways as far as making application. But Matthew chapter 5, 6, and chapter 7, all three chapters record what we would refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is a sermon that Jesus gave. It is the longest recorded sermon by Jesus, and He touches on a lot of different things in those chapters. And primarily He's talking there as He's, of course, Jesus came to uh, offer the kingdom to Israel and they rejected Him. Of course, all that was planned. We know that. But He has given the character of the kingdom. And uh, though He's speaking specifically to that, He is laying principles for the Christian. <coughs> There's nothing wrong with Christians living according to the principles here that we find in, in these chapters in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Nothing wrong with that at all. But I want to uh, try to bring a message this morning, how to handle difficult people. How to handle difficult people. Now you know what? If I was an authority on this subject, I would be a millionaire because I'd be selling books. Amen? <laughs> but uh, I haven't written a book on that. I know how to make people mad. I can write a lot of books on that, on how to make people mad. But I, uh, how to handle difficult people. Isn't that really the, the desire of every leader is, is to learn how to handle difficult people? It is the, the ultimate problem for somebody who uh, is in leadership because as a leader, you are trying to work with and work through other individuals. And if you think about it, a, super, a supervisor's job is not necessarily to keep everybody in line. A supervisor's job is to accomplish the task of many. And he does it through the laborers that he is supervising. That is really the job. And many times on the job, the problem is the worker wants to be the supervisor and doesn't want to do what he's supposed to do. If he'll do his job, the supervisor can do his job better. And, uh, and you know, the, the Christian ought to be the best employee an employer can ever have. But many times, the Christian is the biggest headache the employer has. It ought not be like that. It ought not be like that at all. Let's read verse 43. I'm going, to, I'm going to read these verses down to the end of the chapter. He says, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son, the S-U-N, to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just, and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans, uh, do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. I mentioned this um, Wednesday night. I'm going to mention it again this morning because it certainly applies. Jesus he, he starts out by a common misconception that the Jews had in their mind about one of the commands in the Scripture about us loving our neighbor. And there was a misconception, a misunderstanding of what that command was trying to say back in the book of Leviticus. I'll deal with that in just a moment. And so as he deals with that in his sermon, and he lays out some things for us to learn on how to handle difficult people, he comes down and he tries to reason again around the same idea, not only what we just read, but the verses previous too. And he makes a question, he say, or he makes a statement, he says, uh, for if you love them which love you, what reward have you? And that stands to reason. If we only love people that love us the same, we're not much. Well, that's convenient. You can go happy-go-lucky. But if we truly love people that only love us back, we're going to have a small, small life. He says right here, he says, um, do not even the publicans the same. If you salute your brethren, what do you more than others? You know, that's, that's what we usually try to uh, model our lives around, especially when it comes to uh, dealing with difficult people, when it comes to loving our neighbor. We just try to get and be average. We just want to kind of be a run-of-the-mill Christian. You know, I don't want to talk to many people about the Lord because I don't want to have a stigma on me. I don't want nobody 
coming to me. I just want to exist and get through life and with the least amount of heartache and the least amount of problem. I want to be just average. Well, you know what average is? Average is the worst of the best and best of the worst. Here's average. Here's average. Look up here. Here's average. Here's best. Here's worst. Average is the worst of the best and the best of the worst. That's all average is. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be average. I want to be the best that I can possibly be with the Lord's help. And so we see here this morning that in this um, sermon, uh, Jesus gives some instruction on how we can handle and interact with people that are difficult. Jesus addresses, as I've already mentioned, a misunderstanding that many Jews have and still have today concerning God's command to love. Now in Leviticus 19.18, the Bible says, Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, I am the Lord. Now they took that very literal. Nothing wrong with taking things literal. I take the Bible literal unless the context or the words deem otherwise. Okay? And I think that's the way you ought to interpret the Bible as well. But understand this, that, that the Jew comes to that verse and says, okay, here's the group of people that I'm going to concern myself with loving. And everybody else is my enemy because their reasoning was, if I love somebody, then I have to hate somebody else. And they're my enemy. So my enemy is somebody not in my family. The enemy is somebody who's not a Jew. An enemy is everybody else but just my family. And that was a misapplication of the Scripture. The neighbor is anybody who's near. So as we go through life, anybody who we come in contact with, we ought to treat them as our neighbor. Now there's many different terms of endearment we give to people when you meet somebody. A lot of times I'll say, howdy neighbor. How are you neighbor? And a lot of times I'll say it because I forgot your name. Amen. <laughs> So I'll say, uh, a friend or neighbor, or if, if, uh, if it's a child of God, I'll say, hello, sister, or hello, brother. I'll, a lot of times I don't even use people's first name. Now, just because if, I, if they claim to be a Christian, I'll call them my brother. They're my brother in Christ. If they're, my, if they're a lady and they're saved, they're my sister. Amen? And so I'm thankful uh, for that. But here's something I wanted to look at here. This command was interpreted that if we must love the one, then we must not love the enemies the same way. And so uh, they seem to conveniently overlook who our neighbor really is. And you know what? We do the same thing. You realize that? There are folks sitting here on the, on the chairs uh, in this room this morning, and each one of us conveniently overlook who our neighbor is. We all do it. And our neighbor is everybody. Our neighbor is anybody near unto us. Jesus teaches us how to respond to those who make it their business to make our lives miserable. There are people in this room, amen, there are people in this room who have folks in their family, who have folks they work with, who have folks who live in their neighborhood, and I am one of the folks in this room, and I'm talking about myself too. There are people who it seems as though it, it, they make it their priority in life to make somebody else miserable. How many of y'all know somebody like that? Hold your hands up. Alright, what I want y'all to do is make a list of them so I can put their names on Facebook. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? There are people like that. But there is a Bible remedy for dealing with those people. And it might not be what you think it is. Did you hear what I said? It might not be what you think it is. There are people that uh, it's hard to deal with. And you know what? Jesus had the same kind of people He had to deal with. And if my Lord and your Lord could deal with those people, I think you and I can do the same thing. Now, there's something that we have to understand if we're going to apply the remedy that Jesus gave right here plainly in the Scriptures. There's something that you and I are going to have to remember. And if you don't remember this, my message is going to be of no use to you. So you might as well go ahead and get up right now and walk out the door and I'll see you next service time because if you don't get this, what I'm about to say the rest of the time is going to help you at nothing at all. And here's the point I'm trying to make. If you're going to live by, by what Jesus had to say right here as a child of God, okay, you're going to have to put your feelings aside. If you're going to walk around like I do sometimes, with a chip on your shoulder, just begging for somebody to knock it off your shoulder. 
then you're not going to have any kind of blessing by, by practicing what Jesus said. If you're going to go around with thin skin and everything somebody says to you is going to hurt your feelings, and, and, and you're just only going to bottle up and hedge in and only make yourself vulnerable to those who you trust the most, if that's how you go live your life, then you might as well get up and leave right now because I ain't going to be able to help you. The Word of God ain't going to be able to help you. But if you're willing to put your feelings aside, if you're willing to live a life that's pleasing unto God and quit worrying about what everybody thinks about you and do the right thing, then you're going to get some help and you're going to be blessed in the process. Amen? The reason why the Christian circles are so large as they are today is because people put feelings aside, quit worrying about what everybody thought about them, and shared the gospel and loved people who did not love them back. And I thank God for it. I thank God for some people who put feelings aside and done the right thing because you know what? Eventually I got saved as a result of their actions. Amen? And I want us to look at that this morning. Let's pray. Father, again, thank You for the privilege to share this message. Help me to say everything I should say. Help us to learn how to handle difficult people. I pray, Lord, for somebody here not saved, they don't know Christ, their Lord and Savior, that this will be the day they trust Christ before it's eternally too late. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Uh, there are four maxims or rules or principles that Jesus gives about how to handle folks that are difficult to interact with. He gives four things that we ought to do. Here, here's the first one. Look there, if you would, in verse number 44. Here's where we find our passage. He says this, uh, uh, Love your enemies. Say that with me. Love, love your enemies. Your enemies. Uh, number one, we should love those that hate us. Now that word enemy... <laughs> means those people who are hostile or uh, uh, they act in a hateful manner. That's who an enemy is. Now let me just say that our, our enemy as a Christian is not each other. It's not really the lost people out here that don't claim to know Christ as their Savior. They're not our enemy. And when we treat them like they are an enemy, <coughs> okay, then we have robbed ourselves of a blessing from God, number one. Number two, we have lost an opportunity to share the gospel with them. Did y'all understand that? We cannot live our lives like a hermit, okay, and put our head in the sand and only interact with those that are easy to get along with. I am not your enemy, and you are not my enemy. I don't care how much we disagree, you're not my enemy. And I am not your enemy. That person that cussed you out this week is not your enemy. Now Satan would like to paint the picture that they're your enemy, but they're not. If you can't get along with somebody, that doesn't mean they're your enemy. You know, sometimes the reason why you can't get along is because you're the one that won't get along. You ever thought about that? I meet people all the time, it's always somebody else's fault. They're always the victim. Now, I love playing the part of the victim. Amen? But I also like to be on the other side of the fence, too. I like to be the aggressor. I like to just push push buttons. Amen? My mom used to say, you love to stir the pot. Well, I like to do that every now and then. Amen? But, uh, you know, here's the thing. Uh, quit playing the victim. Grow up. Amen? Grow up. People are hard to work with. And Jesus had the same problem. We should love those that hate us. Jesus, when He said to love our enemies, He used the word agape there. And we understand that word to mean a, a word like in John 3, 16 where it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's a picture of sacrifice. A love with a sacrifice in mind. In other words, I, it's a sacrificial love. If I'm going to love my enemy the way Jesus described right here in this sermon, then that means I ought to be willing to love and to help my neighbor, even though he might be hateful, even though he might be hostile toward me, I'm going to love him to the point of death if necessary. That is what Jesus is saying. He emphatically states that we should love those who do not love us back the same way. Now, how many of y'all love to hear that right now? A couple of you love to hear that. I don't like to hear that because that means I've got to do something. 
You know what? When somebody's hostile towards you, and somebody's being an aggressor towards you, and they're being hateful towards you, and they're acting like they are an arch enemy of you, and you respond in like manner, what's going to happen? More hostility. But if you and I will take the high road, which is usually the road less traveled, if you and I will take the high road and we will obey the, the, the command, if we will heed the advice, if we will obey the sermon that Jesus gave and love our enemies, then I think Blair would be a much happier place to live in. I think Washington County would have a greater impact as far as the gospel is concerned if people did that. Now, Jesus is not asking us to do something that He's not already done. The Bible teaches us that Jesus is the example of love. And you know, many times we say to young people, how do we know God loves us? Or how much does God love us? And we'll do this. He loved us this much. Picturing the cross that Jesus died on. Jesus died on a cross as an innocent substitute. He paid the sin debt of mankind. Did He not? He is an example of one who loved folks that were enemies of God. The Bible declares that a lost sinner, no matter how moral or how upright they might be, somebody who is not saved is an enemy of God. The Bible makes that very plain in several passages. But you know something? You and I that know Christ our Savior, of all people in the room, of all people on the, in the workplace, of all people in Washington County and Blair, you and I should be the ones to exhibit Christ-like behavior. Jesus is not asking us to love our enemies something He has never done. Man, He loved you and I. And at one time, we were His enemies. Amen? Amen. I'm thankful this morning that Jesus loved me in spite of me. Let me ask you a question. Do you love those you uh, the, excuse me? Do you love those that love you only, or do you actively love those who don't love you? Think about that. Do you love only people that love you? If you do, then you're shallow. Amen. There ain't much to your spirituality. If you and I only love those who love us back the same way, we ain't much. And God can't use people that that's the limit of their, their love. That's acting like a two-year-old he wants to go play cars with the, the neighbor kid. And he says, now you can play with all these cars, but you can have this one car, but these are all mine. You can't play with my cars. You can have this one to play with, but these are mine. And you turn your back. That's exactly what we're doing when we love only those who love us. We only let people have a small part of our life and we'll love on everybody else that loves us, but those people that are hostile or whatever, I'm not going to do much with them. And you know why the gulf keeps getting wider? You want to know how come things keep getting worse instead of getting better? Because you're acting like a knucklehead. You're acting like a child. You're shallow. Jesus said, love your enemies. Love your enemies. And that's good advice for the preacher too, amen? This should not just be something that we say in principle. Oh yeah, preacher, I agree with you. Yes, we all love our enemies. I agree with you. That's a good Bible principle. It ought not be just a good thought that we have on our mind. Yeah, you know, I love that person. Um, sometimes uh, people just love on others when it's convenient. But to actively love those who are your enemies, quote unquote, is to do it by investing in their lives by acts of love. If you're going to apply, and if I'm going to apply what Jesus said right here in the Sermon on the Mount about loving our enemies, then that means we're going to have to actively invest in somebody else's life who is hostile toward us, who is hateful toward us, who misrepresents us. We're going to have to actively invest in their lives by acts of love. And some of y'all look at me like a calf there in a new gate. What is this preacher talking about? I'm talking about where the rubber hits the road. Jesus said by this, shall all men know you're my disciples by the love you have one toward another. You know what? Some of my best friends today, some of the people that have made the biggest impact on my life were people who at one time I was hostile towards. 
who I was mean towards, who I said things I shouldn't have said, and when I come out of my mouth, I knew I shouldn't have said those things. I misrepresented them. I misrepresented their motives, and I did it on purpose, and I was spiteful, and I acted as an enemy toward them, but you know what? They didn't treat me the same way. And they invested in me, and they, they went out of their way to love on me. You know what? Little by little, that broke down the wall in my life, and now we're lifelong friends. Don't do back to somebody else that's been hateful. Don't, don't respond in, in the same way. Love on them. Be kind to them. Jesus said to love our enemies. So if you want to have, uh, learn how to handle difficult people, that's one way. Love your enemies. The second thing Jesus said, now this ain't me saying this. This is, this is Jesus. So if you're having a hard time with this message, you're having a hard time with Jesus because I'm just saying what He said. Amen? And look what he says right here. He says, number two, he says, um, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus must really have been out there when he was preaching this sermon for him to say that. To bless somebody who curses you. Now, what does that word bless mean? What does that word curse mean? Well, the word bless is not a word you're going to want to hear what it means. I can tell you right now because I know some of you. And you're just like me. You don't want to know what this word bless means. But I'm going to have to tell you anyhow. You're not going to like it. The word bless means to eulogize them. Not as if they're dead. Okay? <laughs> but to eulogize them while they're still living. The word, you know, when somebody gives a eulogy, they're talking, it's usually at some sort of um, a graveside thing where they, they talk about all the good things and they speak well of somebody. But the word bless right there has the idea of speaking well of somebody. So Jesus is asking you and I to eulogize or to speak well of those that curse us. He's asking us to speak well of somebody who does not speak well of us in return. In fact, the word curse has the idea of dooming somebody or damning somebody. Now think about what Jesus is saying. He is saying, love your enemies, bless those that curse you. So those people that want to curse you, that never have anything good to say, and we smart off and come back with something real clever, and we go off and tell our friends, well, this is what I told so and so. I do that sometimes. Did you know that? I'm getting cut to shreds right here trying to preach this morning. But I'm going to tell you something. To bless somebody, to speak well of somebody who does not do the same in return is to be Christ-like. Think about it. Jesus, when He was on that cross dying in our place, He cried out, Father, do what? For they, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If my Lord Jesus can hang on that cross, suffering and dying on that cross, to pay my sin, to be my substitute. If, if Jesus can do that for me, then I can tell you right now, I know we can do that for Him. Just because somebody doesn't like you and just because somebody don't want to speak well of you, I know that's hard to understand because it's hard for me to understand. There's people in this town I've had maybe two conversations with and they have totally misrepresented my motives on a number of fronts. I can think of one person in particular who I maybe spent 10 minutes with when I, right after I first moved to town a few months. A 10 minute conversation, if that, briefly explained why I was here because they asked me. And from that brief encounter with me, it had got turned all over town, something totally opposite, and to speak in derogatory about my family. Now, I don't understand that. Well, first of all, they, I don't know that they even say to begin with. They, I'm sure they claim to be saved. I don't believe they're saved. No. A saved person should not do that. These people have no remorse over it. None. If I died today, they'd go by my grave marker and spit on the tombstone as they walk by. Why? I have no idea. Maybe my breath stunk when I talked to them. Maybe my deodorant was not as, as, as uh, fresh as it should have been. I don't know. 
But you know what? I'm not going to be everybody's cup of tea, and I'm okay with that. If they don't be, be friends with me, they don't want. That's fine. If they want to be wrong, let them be wrong all day long. I don't care. But you know what Jesus tells me to do? To speak well of those people and not respond in like manner. Don't curse them. You know what? When we curse somebody back, when we get when we go back at somebody, you might be right in what you're saying. You might be stating the truth. But when you come back at somebody in re, in reaction to what they said to you. You're stupid to their level. Let me give you a real practical example. Um, I can't mention names. I just might get back to the folks back in Carolina by way of internet, video, and all that sort of thing. There was a company I worked for, and we had subcontractors that would do some work for us. And it was a partnership. These two guys had gotten together. And they, had a, they had a very good business. They made good money. They were machinists. And they had this great partnership. One of them was good about making the stuff and the other one run his mouth and was good at selling stuff. And so between the two of them, they really complimented each other and they had a strong business. And one of them's father was also involved in business. I, I'm telling you what, they do is just tremendous work. They turned out great work, great pricing, and I would love to work with them. Well, there come a rift in that partnership. And before long, the one that run his mouth all the time, the sales, salesman type guy, Good guy, I liked him. But he, he was a talker. He could run his mouth and like I say he could sell and stuff. Next thing I know, he's working at the factory I'm working at. And without fail, every time I got around that guy, he was telling me how bad and how rotten the other person was. I mean, it's like he was defensive all the time, just always saying something all the time. And I know he was hurt. And I know he wanted he, he was a talker and he had to talk it out. He was hurt and he wanted to get off. I understand all that. But he didn't say hardly anything good about the guy. It was always what this guy done to him. What this guy done was wrong. Well, in like manner, I'd encounter the other guy when he would come in to bring in stuff and, and work with him. And I had to work with this guy real close after this point. And it, it went on and on and on. And I, and I got to noticing something. I told my boss, man, I said, you know what? I said, in this last several months when this rift happened, I said, you know what? I never heard one ill word spoken from this one guy towards the other. But I heard all bad from this one guy back the other way. I said, don't that show you something? He said, Andrew, you're exactly right. The Lord taught me something right there. And it's this. When somebody wrongs you, yeah, it's good to talk to somebody to get off your chest and all that. I understand that. But don't go tell everybody under the sun what's going on. Talk to Jesus about it. I went and told that fella that, that didn't say nothing. I said, and I told him this months later. I said, you know something? I want you to know I, you really helped me as a pastor. He said, what do you mean? He always looked up to me. I said, man, you helped me as a pastor. And I said, you taught me something. He said, what do you mean? I, I told him. The man began to tear up. He said, you know what? He said, that was hard on me. He says, I, don't, I, I, had, I, I, I taught my wife and my dad about it, but I tried to just not say nothing. I knew what he was doing, and it hurt. But, it, but and I regret all that went on, but he didn't say anything. Even then he wouldn't talk back to God. That's character, man. Hey, bless them that curse you. Do we speak well of those who speak ugly about us? Jesus says to, number three, real, i got to hurry. We should do good things to those who detest us. Look what it says right here. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you. Now the word hate right here is a different word uh, than, than the other place. Do good things, not hurtful things. Respond to those who detest you by doing kind things for them. Do not respond in the same subpar standard, but follow Christ's example. Think about this. Jesus died for every sin, did He not? Amen. Not just the ones that He loved more than others that He died for everything. He died for everybody's sin, right? Not just some, some select group, regardless of what some theologians might try to teach you. Jesus died for every sin. Do good to them that hate you. There are people that detest you. When your name is brought up, evil thoughts come across their mind, I'm sure. People detest you and I. If you claim to know Christ your Savior, I can tell you right now, lost people don't like you. Especially those that are really in gross sin. They don't like you and I. The mention of your name in connection with Christ or a church, you're on their hit list. 
They detest you, but Jesus says do good to them. Do good to them. Don't get this sound opposite of what we would do. If they're going to kick me, I'm going to kick them back with a bigger boot. If they're going to punch me, I'm going to have a, I may have a velvet glove, there's going to be an iron fist inside of that thing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if they're going to say that, hey, I tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to get back in like man. That's what you and I, that's what our flesh wants to do. I'll tell you what Jesus said, dude. He says, do good to them. So let me ask you a question. Do you only do good things for those who do good things for you? Do you only do good things to those and for those that do good things to you? Again, if that's how we do things, then we're pretty shy. If you want to broaden your horizons as a Christian, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them. Do good things to them that hate you. Last of all, we should earnestly pray for those who would persecute us. Look what it says there. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, that word pray right there is a, is a unique word. It has the idea to supplicate or to earnestly pray for someone. Now, when we talk about this, we're not talking about a now a lady down to sleep child's prayer. We're talking about clearing off the calendar for the evening Go in our prayer closet, wherever that might be, and get along with God and spend some time with the Lord about this person and this situation. And really praying for yourself and for them. Now I'm going to tell you what, as a pastor, it's hard to get along with everybody. Especially when you preach your heart out, somebody hears your message and they took it totally wrong. And before they even come to you about it, they told half the county something that ain't true. Now I tell you, that's what bothers me. And it's it's hard to love those that, that are just aggravating to deal with. It really is. But you know what I've found over the years that there's been times when I, that I've been at odds with somebody in the congregation. And uh, I've been wrong at times and they've been wrong at times. But you know what I found made the biggest difference in my life as a pastor and a leader? Was when I got a burden to pray for them. And at first my prayers were all about them. Lord, straighten them out. Lord, they need to get right with you. They're gonna, they, 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 you know, and I would, I was just preaching a sermon about how they should get right. And then after a while, about a week or two of that, the Lord kind of tapped on my shoulder and said, Andrew, what about you? You've told me all about them. What about you? Then I began to see how I was treated. And how I was doing things, and I thought I was right for what I was doing, but I got to realize, you know what? They may have been the right thing, but I was doing it the wrong way, the wrong motive. And God smote my heart. And you know what? After a little while of praying and God working on me, guess what happened? Things was fine. Amen? Things was fine. And the Lord was working on their hearts. The Lord working on my heart. We finally got together and He said, Brother Andrew, don't worry about it. The Lord showed me something. I said, Well, Brother, don't you worry about it. The Lord showed me something. And now we're fine. Now, it don't always work out that way, sad, sad to say, but I wish it did. Now, that word despitefully there, is an interesting word as well. That word means to insult. It means to slander. It means to falsely accuse. So Jesus is saying to pray for those, earnestly pray for them. I'm, not, I'm talking about investing some time of your, of your day in praying for these people who are insulting you who are slandering you, who are falsely accusing you, who is misrepresenting your motives, who they, they talk ill about you, they don't say anything good about you, they don't like you, and you know that. And Jesus said to pray for them. The word persecute adds a little bit to this. The word persecute has the idea of pursuing after with the ideas of causing persecution. Now I want you to think about something. So here we have people in our lives, right? <coughs> they slander us. They insult us. They detest us. They hate us. They would spit on our grave if they had the opportunity. And Jesus is telling you and I that we ought to pray for them even though they're pursuing after us to persecute us. In the midst of that pursuing of us, every opportunity they get, you know people like that, every opportunity they give a chance to put their two cents worth, they ought to keep their two cents because they're going broke. Amen? <laughs> but they, they want to give their two cents worth every time. You know what? If we, In the midst of them pursuing us with all that, 
Just keep on praying. Keep on praying. Now, here's uh, let me just sum up everything by saying this. As a child of God, you're not going to get along with everybody and everybody's not going to get along with you. Romans tells us, as much as lies within us, live peaceably with all men. There's some people you're not going to get along with. And that's fine. I, you just got to come to just whatever. But at the same time, I want to challenge all of us. We can handle difficult people. The bigger our church gets, the more difficult people we're going to have in it. Because you know what? All of us is difficult people. Amen. I'm difficult, and you know that. And I know Chris is difficult. There's nobody else in here. All right? We're all difficult. Amen? We're all hard-headed. And we all don't see eye to eye. But you know what? That's okay. But here's the thing we got to do, guys. we got to grow up. And Jesus said... Jesus said to love your enemies. That means loving people who hate you. <laughs> Invest in their lives by acts of love. You know what they'll do? They'll, they'll broaden your horizons. They'll give you opportunities of ministry. You don't talk good about those that talk bad about you. Like that fellow I told you about whose that partnership broke up and that guy, all he could say was bad things. He spoke good things. Made a big impact. Impress me as a pastor. It helped me as a pastor. He'll, that guy will never know what he'd done to me by doing that. That helped me so much, and I saw it live out in front of me. I said, you know what? That is. I don't know if them other guys even profess to be saved, but you know what? That one guy should sure acted Christ like. He impressed me. Do good to those that don't do good to you. Do good deeds. Be kind to them. Go do something for them. Bring them, bring them a gift. Love on them. Encourage them. And Jesus said to pray for those at the spot. I mean, we're talking about the, the crowd I do not want to pray for is the crowd I'm supposed to pray for. Let me read, turn back in your Bibles. I'm going to read two Psalms to you. Psalm 56 and Psalm 57. I could go to a lot of them, but I'm just going to read them. And I want you to read and listen to what David had to say about this situation. Because you know what? David is facing some hard times in his life. In Psalm 56, the Philistines have him in Gath. And listen to what he says. Listen to what David said about his enemies. He cries out in prayer, Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would what? Swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Sounds like to me he's got some people it's hard to handle, don't you? Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, but they... For they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word, in God I will put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. They tear my words, is what he's saying. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather themselves together, they hide themselves, they mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger, cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my wanderings. Thou put thou my tears in thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God will I, pray, I pray, praise His word. In the Lord will I praise His word. In God, if I put my trust, I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I render praise unto thee, for thou hast delivered my soul from death. Will not thou deliver my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Listen to Psalm 57. This is when he was hiding in the cave from Saul. Be merciful unto me, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth uh, all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Selah. God shall send forth His mercy and His truth. Now listen to verse 4. My soul is among lions. Listen to what David is saying. There are lions all about that are ready to pounce upon me and devour me. And I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are as spears and arrows, and their tongue as a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. 
My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me in the midst whereof uh, they are fallen themselves. Selah. My heart is fixed, O oh God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I will. I myself will wake early. I will praise Thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto Thee among the nations. For Thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and Thy truth unto the clouds. Be Thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let Thy glory be above all the earth. David, in both of these psalms, tells the Lord in, 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 a, in a psalm how he is being oppressed, how the enemies have surrounded him, their teeth are his uh, swords and spears, and how they're... Uh, it's a sharp arrow he talks about. talks about being surrounded by lions. Is that, is that not how we feel sometimes? Whenever these enemies of ours, these that curse us, these that despitefully use and persecute us, is this not how we feel many times in our lives? Or am I just an oddball? I think we all feel like this. And here's the how you handle difficult people. You don't treat them like an enemy. Don't treat them like an enemy. You love them. <laughs> you don't have to be gullible. I didn't say gullible. I said love them. <laughs> love is a decision most of the time. The feelings will follow. But love's a decision. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. <laughs> Do good to them that, uh, uh, that, uh, excuse, that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use and persecute you. If you'll do that, you'll find the secret in how to handle difficult people. You don't have to go buy somebody's book out here by Dr. Spock or whoever else. Go to the book. Jesus tells you how to deal with them. Amen. Right here. Very simple. Four simple maxims on how to handle difficult people. I don't know about you, but I think I need to go find an altar somewhere and crawl under it and spend some time there because I'm as guilty as anybody else in this room. God spoke to my heart this week about this passage and about these, these verses. I'm going to tell you something. All of us need to practice this. If we did, some of those situations that trouble us wouldn't be as big as we think they are. That's right. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know that God loves you. Jesus loves you. The church loves you. You can have all your sins forgiven by repenting of your sins and turning your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and He'll work in your heart and you can be saved by the grace of God. Every hit battle we act like.